Now, it is my pleasure to welcome Inspector General Dan Levinson to the stage. <clears throat> Dan has been kind enough to speak at this conference every year for as long as I can remember, and his willingness to share the OIG's perspectives on compliance is invaluable information for all of us in this profession. Dan has headed the Office of Inspector General for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services since 2005. HHS is among the largest departments in the federal government, encompassing uh, Medicare, Medicaid, public health, and mental health services, to name a few. As Inspector General, Mr. Levinson leads an independent and objective organization of more than 1,600 auditors, evaluators, investigators, and lawyers who oversee the integrity and the efficiency of the nation's trillion dollar annual investment in federal health and human service programs. Please welcome Dan Levinson. Hey Dan, thank you. Thank you, Debbie, and good morning everyone. Uh, and thank you again, Kim, for sharing uh, an update uh, with respect to Justin. It, it always gives me a lump in my throat when I uh, hear about the trials and the tribulations of the Lankford family and how much progress has been made and the wonderful partnership that exists between ACCA and the America's Fund. Uh, it's great to be with you uh, here this morning, and uh, we have uh, an ambitious agenda. HCCA has an ambitious agenda this week. You have an awful lot on your plate. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be a very, very busy week, but right now I think it's a good idea to relax. Just take a deep breath, uh, take in the schedule, and think about how much you already know. I could see by all of the people who had been at the academies that this is a very knowledgeable collection of people. And what we're going to do this morning is we're going to go through some of some slides that are going to give you an idea of some of the big, the big things that we need to be thinking about in healthcare compliance this week and when you return to work. But before going to that, I do want to congratulate Roy Snell on an incredibly successful tenure as CEO of HCCA. It has been a wonderful partnership uh, with Roy at the helm. Uh, he's been a terrific leader, and I've so much enjoyed working with him over the years. And uh, congratulations to him and to the board and to the staff of HCCA who have done such a wonderful job in building an organization that is so important to our healthcare infrastructure. Uh, it's always very inspiring to be here at the Institute. And uh, the folks who have built this organization have done an enormous public service, uh, not just to the industry, but to the nation, uh, given the footprint that uh, healthcare represents in our nation's economy and in our nation's mental and physical health and security. Uh, I also want to uh, welcome Jerry Zach uh, to the position of CEO and look forward to working with him. Uh, Jerry, I happen to be a certified fraud examiner, so I, I, I have some pride in the fact that you have been elevated to this position. Good to see a CFE uh, make it to the top. Well, it's good to be with you here in Vegas. Uh, we, uh, before we get to the, the slides I want to share with you, I was thinking as I, uh, as I landed here yesterday uh, that it's been a couple of years since I've been to Vegas. And uh, although this morning we'll be talking about how to avoid bad behaviors, uh, I was actually thinking um, about good behaviors that I first want to share with you in response uh, to bad events to horrific events because it was on my mind as I came in about uh, what happened here in Las Vegas six months ago and uh, the incredible uh, response, uh, the, the acts of kindness, the financial support, uh, what's happened uh, among the people of Las Vegas and the business community here uh, to rebuild uh, after that horrible event. 
And I don't know whether we have uh, in the room folks from the local Las Vegas healthcare community and law enforcement, but uh, there were just incredible acts of heroism uh, that, were, that were committed here. And, and uh, it, was, it, 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 stay, it has stayed with me, and, and I suspect it has stayed with many Americans. Uh, the idea that uh, such horrific events uh, can, uh, can also trigger uh, such incredible acts uh, of charity, of service, of commitment to being able to rebuild. I don't think there's a part of the country that hasn't been affected over the last few years by some either natural or man-made disaster that, that has triggered a need for the healthcare community and the law enforcement community in many cases to, to come together uh, in response. And it is really quite remarkable, uh, the responsiveness of, of the healthcare community. And I have a, a special pride to share with you with our criminal in investigators, our special agents who are stationed all around the country and whose day job is to fight healthcare fraud. But in many cases, uh, they too have responded in very individual, personal ways, uh, even as they have been impacted by these events. Uh, to help rebuild uh, the healthcare infrastructure, to assist with local law enforcement. Uh, we've had uh, lots of heroes within my organization uh, to assist in some of these terrible events. So uh, I just want to salute them and to salute really us as part of a very important healthcare system uh, that, that responds to a variety of challenges over the years. Uh, there's a lot of good news uh, to share about that in response to terrible events uh, that, have, uh, that have really hurt the country, um, but never permanently because we have a tremendous ability to rebound and to rebuild, even as we never forget uh, the impact that uh, these events have on families, on communities, and make sure that we're, we're all in it for, for the long haul. Uh, we're, I'm going to share with you some uh, slides about some of the issues that we need to be focusing on now and in the future. Uh, they're going to be paired with, uh, with slides that we'll also share with you uh, who to uh, hear from as presenters uh, during the next few days from HHS OIG. I'm accompanied, uh, as I have been in years past, by just a terrific collection of, uh, of folks from, uh, from our office. Uh, most of them in Washington, but not all of them, a uh, collection of lawyers and of uh, investigators. Um, our best and brightest are here as presenters, and I want to make sure that you're able to pair up uh, these subjects with the people who can dig down and drill deep on the things that you need to hear from us about. The power of data. Uh, we, we are, uh, we're at a very exciting point, I think, in the evolution of the data revolution. Uh, when I think back uh, two decades ago to when ACCA was just getting started, uh, the era of managed care, of HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act just getting started, empowering uh, the Inspector General's office at HHS to be a much larger player in the healthcare field, to, to have dedicated funding uh, to fighting healthcare fraud in Medicare and in Medicaid, and being able to provide advice and counsel to the industry on kickback and our various False Claims Act and healthcare fraud laws and policies and regulations. Um, electronic mail, I think, was, was really the thing that we pretty much relied upon for communication and for information. Uh, a lot has transpired over those last 20 years and, and uh, with the development of mobile technology and the explosion of big data, uh, we now need to really focus on how we can use data to identify fraud risks most effectively. Because it really is a matter of d being able to do data-driven decision-making. Uh, when it comes to identifying fraud risk. After all, what, what should we be testing? What should we be monitoring? What should we be auditing? That's a matter of relying more and more on the power of data. Uh, we look at op open payments law, like the current, like the, the, the most recent Sunshine Law, which, which opens up 
uh, the opportunity to understand where funding comes from on a lot of the research uh, that is produced. Not that the research is necessarily compromised by funding sources from certain industries, but we need to know about it. Uh, we have a right to know, and the power of data allows us to understand much better uh, where funding streams are from and present people an opportunity to explain what impact, if any, the, that kind of funding may, may have. Uh, the last 20 years has seen the development of coordinated care models, which so much depend upon, again, uh, big data, uh, being able to provide predictive analytics about how we can structure coordinated care models that will actually deliver better care at lower cost. Uh, the promises that have been made really over the last 20 years by medical experts, healthcare experts, together with information technology experts who are putting together their areas of expertise and saying, you know, we can deliver better care if we work together, if we do it in a coordinated way. And that really requires, uh, again, the power of data. Of course, with data comes an enormous amount of information that not only can be used effectively, but also can be abused. And there's always an important need to keep in mind the security and the privacy requirements that were surfaced initially years ago by HIPAA, uh, but continue to be very, very important factors that have to be put into place uh, so that we use the data properly and that people's medical records are protected in the way that they are required to be. And so you need to be able to rely upon the experts that bring that information. And one of the great things about these conferences is that you, uh, you have the opportunity to bring together the IT experts uh, with medical professionals and with your management consultants and with your healthcare counsel so that you can see it in a holistic way. Uh, that's what we're doing in a sense at the federal level with the Healthcare Fraud Prevention Partnership, uh, which has developed over the last few years between uh, government players and a lot of the private insurers who more and more are being able to use data uh, to understand fraud patterns, uh, to be able to, to uh, provide useful toolkits on, for example, opioid prescribing and how we can better understand where the patterns of abuse are likely to emerge, both in public and in private sector work. Uh, although HIPAA 20 years ago talked about effective partnerships between uh, the public and private sector when it came to uh, health care, uh, only really with the development of effective data tools have we been able to make true use of an effective partnership. And I'm very proud of, of being a part of the Healthcare Fraud Prevention Partnership and making real progress uh, just over these last few years. You can hear more about these important topics uh, from Gary Cantrell. Uh, and from Susan Gillen of our office. Gary, head of our investigations. Susan, uh, one of our senior lawyers, uh, who will be able to provide you the kind of information on the data subjects that we need to focus on uh, with, uh, with great specificity. Uh, we need to talk about outcomes and their relationship to compliance programs. Inputs, Outputs, outcomes. Let's define our terms and make sure we understand the differences. Uh, compliance programs are an input. Um, uh, they're not the only input. We have quite a few inputs uh, to how we develop effective integrity with our programs. Um, tone at the top is an input. The culture that's developed is an input. Of course, high quality healthcare providers is an input. These are all very important factors in developing uh, an effective healthcare infrastructure. Those inputs are designed to give us problem identification and prepare us for the appropriate response. Uh, problems uh, occur across a wide range of areas as we know. Medically unnecessary services, for example, 
where the cath lab nurses go to hospital management and say, you know, this, this doctor is performing cardiac catheterizations on every patient he meets. Uh, we know, don't we, that the appropriate response of the hospital isn't to look at the billings and immediately name a wing of the hospital after the doctor. <laughs> Unfortunately, that actually is a case. Uh, credentialing failures uh, are way too common, uh, where we have a pill mill doctor who overprescribes one jurisdiction after another, and the board pulls the license, and the doctor just goes on to the next state, and no one takes a look at why this person has moved with such alacrity across so much of a part of the United States, and yet compliance offices are capable of being able to put together that kind of pattern of abuse and figure out that there may be a, a, a serious problem with someone uh, who has moved so often, whose license is pulled from one jurisdiction to the next, even if there isn't any reference made in the record. Uh, kickbacks, of course, always, a, always an issue if you have you know, free, free shipping services, uh, free test cups, uh, phlebotomy services. Uh, from a uh, potential referral source, it's, it's uh, sometimes free is too expensive. Sometimes free is too expensive. What we're looking for ultimately is to lower risk. Th these are risks that come with the territory. And the outcome is lower risk. You'll be able to hear more about this important subject from Andrea Treese Berlin, who will talk about self-disclosures, report repayment, and the options. Uh, these are our very important responses to these problems. And to Marturzian, who will talk about the self-disclosure and managing the risk. It's worth making a distinction here when we talk about effective compliance programs between luck and risk. And it seemed to me that this was just the right place to talk about it. <laughs> I've got nothing against luck, uh, especially here locally. Um, it's, it's good to have, I think it's good to have luck. In fact, I'd like to see you all as winners here during the next few days when you have a little time off and you're not spending the rent money. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'd like to be close by, you know, when, if you win at the table, so you can turn to me and say, hey, I won, let me buy you a drink. <laughs> uh, and then I can respond to you, well, I, I don't drink at 11 a.m., actually. <laughs> and I probably shouldn't accept a drink from you anyway, but I would be very happy to see you win. Uh, but when we talk about luck, we're talking about luck locally. Here, we're not really talking about what should be on our minds when we're back at the office. When we're back at the office, it's really not about luck at all. Luck is not a strategy. Uh, and there happens to be a blogger named Morgan Housel. He's written for Motley Fool in the Wall Street Journal, um, who's written uh, very incisively about the distinction between luck and risk. And uh, I think he's worth quoting. He says, luck is the flip side of risk. You cannot understand one without appreciating the other. If risk is what happens when you make good decisions but end up with a bad outcome, luck is what happens when you make a bad or mediocre decision but end up with a great outcome. They both happen because the world is too complex to allow 100% of your actions dictate 100% of your outcomes. They are mirrored cousins driven by the same thing. You are one person in a seven billion player game, and the accidental impact of other people's actions can be more consequential than your own. But experiencing risk makes you recognize that some stuff is out of your control, which is accurate feedback that helps you adjust your strategy. Experiencing luck doesn't. It generates the opposite feedback a false feeling that you are in control because you did something and then got the outcome you wanted, which is terrible feedback if you're trying to make good, repeatable, long-term decisions. 
And that's why OIG makes an effort to reward as much as possible those who come forward with self-disclosures. They say, you know, we, we, we're working on lowering risk. And when we find the problem, we're prepared to report on it. We don't count on luck in, in uh, it perhaps going away. We can't really factor luck in, but we need to factor risk in. Dynamic compliance is something that we're going to have to think about as a, as a, uh, as a natural expression of where we are for the foreseeable future. Uh, because we're unquestionably in a, in a period of transition uh, from the traditional fee-for-service, which is still the predominant model uh, that, that we all need to work with, from fee-for-service to managed care, and to new kinds of, of, uh, of structures that will be far more coordinated and arranged in a way uh, so that we are not paying so much for episodic care, but much more for continuing of services and the bundling of payments. And this uh, shift to a more value-oriented healthcare system is going to present with, uh, to us new risks, new problems. It will simply be a, a, a manner of applying the enormous experience that we've gained over the last couple of decades in a fee-for-service environment to a new, a new landscape uh, that will present different kinds of issues, uh, notwithstanding that we'll, we'll still need to focus on where is the potential gaming, where is the loss of value, uh, where are the, where's the outright fraud that will be perpetrated in some cases, both to protect our, the public fisc, the money, as well as to protect our patients. You can, you'll be able to hear in great detail about this in the coming few days from Vicki Robinson, who will be talking about compliance design in a world of new models, and Jennifer Michael, who will talk about kickback and stark law developments. Because even, even as we make these transitions, uh, these laws remain on the books and will be very important uh, benchmarks in which to understand how we transition from older models to the newer ones in a way that protects the programs and protects patients. And protecting patients is actually what, of course, we're all about. Uh, it's patients first. Uh, OIG has prepared uh, an opioids data brief uh, that combines a lot of the expertise that we bring in program evaluation, in criminal investigations, uh, in auditing so that we can better understand the prescribing abuses that have occurred with opioids, how we can focus on particular areas of the country that have experienced uh, the worst parts of the epidemic and how we can better uh, control our own programs and their expenditures so that we continue to reduce the incredible adverse impact that opioid overprescribing over has had. Uh, we're doing a great deal of work in cross-disciplinary group, group homes and non-institutional care uh, because as we continue to move towards more neighborhood, more non-institutional settings for delivery of health care, we need to continue to see how we can make sure that we account for the expenditures that are made and that we ensure that the quality of care that's supposed to actually increase as a result of this movement out of institutional into uh, less institutional settings actually occurs. And you'll be able to hear more about this in detail from Greg Dembski, our chief counsel, and Gary Cantrell, our head of investigations on OIG developments as part of a panel this week, as well as from Laura Ellis, who will share with you a corporate integrity agreement success story, settlement implementation, and effectiveness. I have news to share with you. Uh, I always like to leave you with something new, something that you perhaps have not heard about before, and I know you haven't heard about this before, and that is that we have just put up in, in the last few hours on our website a new compliance resources portal. And that is designed 
to give uh, a far more concentrated effort uh, in uh, being able to navigate the various compliance tools that appear on our website. Uh, over the years, as we have added more and more of our work and our developments to the website, uh, we've come to understand that the navigation of that can be a challenge if you're looking for one particular area uh, that may actually spread across a number of different topics and subjects. So our wonderful web experts, along with our technical and substantive experts, have come up with a, a, a portal that will allow compliance professionals, I think, a much improved opportunity to use the various resources that appear on our website in a far more effective way. So please uh, take the opportunity, uh, if not uh, this week while you're busy at the conference, but when you get back to work to take a look at our new compliance resources portal. You'll be able to hear more about it uh, this week from Karen Glassman on current compliance guidance, uh, as well as from uh, N Nicole Kosi, who will provide corporate integrity agreement developments, and again, we'll, we'll be able to reference uh, our, new, our new portal. So I've given you a, a kind of something of a laundry list of our presenters. It's going to be a bit of a challenge for you to actually hear all of them since they're paired in many cases uh, to present at the same time. So you'll have to choose. Uh, but by all means, I hope you can uh, take advantage of at least one or, or more of our presenters this week. And for those uh, that you're not able to see, uh, here at the conference, please know that through the podcasts and, and, and the other resources that are on our website, uh, you'll be able to catch up with a lot of what they're doing, uh, even if you're not able to actually catch uh, the breakout session here. Um, these presenters are this afternoon, as you saw the list, and I also have up now who's presenting tomorrow and on Wednesday. Uh, follow us, of course, on all of our social media, uh, we've become very, I think, tech savvy as an office uh, in being able to provide information updated uh, on practically a daily basis. Uh, so take advantage of that. Uh, I think you're in for, again, a very exciting week here at HCCA. I'm always so impressed at what you're able uh, to accomplish. And for me, I think the most exciting thing about being here is not so much being up here on the stage uh, to talk with you from a distance, but being able to connect with you personally in the hallway. So many of you um, have, uh, have been uh, very, very kind to catch me for a few minutes and just, and just talk about your work uh, with me and for me to have an idea of what, uh, of what some of the challenges that you face. And I have to tell you, as a, as a parting thought, that uh, I read and I hear so much these days, perhaps you do too, about uh, the crisis of values in America and uh, you know, questions about whether uh, Americans' commitment to honesty and integrity and service are not being in some way diminished. And I can only, in response, uh, say that uh, the folks who, who write that or talk about it they need to attend this conference. They need to, they need to walk these halls uh, because it's, it's very inspiring uh, to be with you, even if for, for a few days, and to appreciate uh, how committed you are uh, to this incredibly important mission that we really share as partners, as public and private partners, in being able to provide the kind of quality health care uh, that the nation requires and deserves and to do so in such a responsible fashion and really strengthen the country in, 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 in numerous ways by, by doing so. It's, it's very inspiring to be here with you. May God bless you in this week and in all of your work ahead. Thank you so much.